Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Before we get started with our great uh, panelists, uh, I want to just, uh, I'm Yael Aronoff, the director of the Sterling Institute for Jewish Studies in Modern Israel, and I want to just announce a few upcoming events that we have. So on April 3rd, right here in Case Hall, also at 5.30, we have uh, two representatives of the group Standing Together uh, coming to join us. Um, it's Itamar Avneri and Rula Daoud. Um, it's a grassroots uh, movement mobilizing Jewish and Palestinian citizens of an Israel in pursuit of peace, equality, and social and climate justice. Um, they're doing all kinds of great things. And then on April 13th and um, yeah, sorry, April 13th and 14th, there's a two-day uh, working conference here at Michigan State University uh, with lots of um, Palestinian and Israeli uh, peace-building non-governmental organizations, uh, and people are welcome to join that. That's something that we did not organize, but we are uh, also promoting. Uh, and also, if you're interested in Israeli-Palestinian issues on um, April 11th at 5.30 uh, in the James Madison College Library, also in case we're having one of our alums, who was a Jewish Studies minor and James Madison College student, uh, present uh, his book that was just published this year, Israel, American Jews and Palestinian Rights, A History, 1948 to 1978. Uh, so we have lots of other programming, also our annual Holocaust lecture in uh, April, but also um, many, a uh, lot of programs that pertain to helping us understand uh, the current situation and move forward uh, in trying to create change. Uh, so before uh, we get started uh, today, um, Professor Vered Weiss is going to introduce her colleagues and is going to introduce this uh, wonderful book, which uh, they uh, co edited. Um, and we have complimentary copies for the people who are here uh, Israeli culture and emergency routine. Um, and uh, Vered is just a fabulous, fabulous professor uh, here at Michigan State University. Uh, she's an integrated arts and humanities who teaches on Israeli film and cinema, uh, Jewish uh, uh, all, um, literature from all over the world, including Jewish and Israeli literature, uh, teaches classes on Jerusalem, uh, and has just been an amazing teacher on campus, an amazing colleague, and of course also has um, really impactful scholarship. Uh, so uh, in addition to uh, this book, um, she's, uh, she's published many other things. Sorry, I'm trying to, I thought I had the, the right page. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, she, uh, she's presenting on borderline outcasts, intellect, and marginality in conferences at the Association of Israel Studies and International Comparative Literature Association, um, and has uh, several other publications. So we're thrilled to have you here. We're thrilled to have our guest scholars uh, who came from Israel and Greece uh, to join us. And for those of you who'd like, we have a second part of the panel tomorrow at 10.30 a.m. in the same place for people who'd like to come in person. And we're going to have uh, two additional scholars uh, zooming in. Um, so there'll be additional contri contributor contributors and uh, expanded discussion tomorrow morning. So with that, uh, Professor Vered Weiss, uh, thank you so much and thank you all for being here. Before we start, um, I would just like to note uh, the book, as the title suggests, uh, Israeli Culture and Emergency Routine Normalizing Stress, is about trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder. And we're going to discuss uh, traumatic um, issues. Um, and um, look forward to a candid discussion. Uh, so it is my pleasure to introduce my colleagues, um, Dr. Avner Dinon, who uh, labels himself as a secular theologian. He lives in Stirot by the border with Gaza. He's lecturer of Jewish studies at Sapir College in Barilan University, where he teaches courses on Jewish identity, secularism in Israel, 
radical theology, Zionism, medieval Jewish theology, and more. His research in the last few years focuses on the topic of quote-unquote secular theology through the works of Hans Jonas, Emmanuel Levinas, and Martin Buber. And his recent book, just recently published, is Something to Believe in, Secular Theology. It is also my great pleasure to introduce Iri Tonen, who is a PhD candidate just waiting for that final uh, signature uh, at, at Ben Gurion University of the Negev and was teaching fellow at the Department of Multidisciplinary Studies at Sapir Academic College. Her PhD dissertation deals with the poetry of prominent Israeli poet Aaron Shabtai as a unique meeting point between classical Greek world, uh, Judaic ancient texts and modern poetry. Um, Ritonen participated as a fellow in the Human Rights and Judaism program at the Israeli Democracy Institute. Israeli Culture and Emergency Routine, Normalizing Stress, is a collection of academic articles that exposes the impact of continuous war and trauma on cultural and academic discourses. So there are nine chapters, um, and the nine chapters engage with a variety of cultural artifacts, including poetry, prose, film, and graphic novels. And we cast a wide temporal net reaching from as early as the 1960s to 2019. And the collection reveals the prevalence of stress and trauma in Jewish-Israeli cultural production, as well as the diversity of cultural engagement with, this, with these issues. What we see is that, uh, or suggest, is that the local cultural engagement with stress and trauma can perhaps be productively explored in the context of broad worldwide crises. Now we started working on this project in 2018. I think it's very important for us to stress this book is not a recent reaction to recent events, uh, but rather uh, the fruit of many years. We were just wondering if it's five or six years of work. And so we started working on the book in 2018 when Israel was under another quote-unquote round of rocket attacks from Gaza. And my colleagues and I um, joined a group of scholars uh, with the aim of supporting each other and initially it was planned that we will exchange our research, right, show each, other, um, each other's work, and support each other. And as we shared our work and supported each other, trying to figure out how to carry on under constant rocket attack, um, a tentative idea about a um, collected, uh, special issue in a uh, journal began to uh, emerge. And then the project was delayed, and then COVID hit the world and slowed us down further. And anyone who knows anything about academic publishing, and especially a co-edited volume, knows that it's a special kind of cat herding. So the project took us about five or almost six years. The final edits deadline was October 5th, 2023. Now, I probably would never have remembered the final edits deadline, but of course I remember the final edits deadline because of October 7th. And we were just able to insert a dedication. And this is the dedication we inserted. This book is dedicated to all the people impacted by the October 2023 attacks including our friends and loved ones who contributed to the making of this book. We hope for the end of the cycle of violence and for a better future. We also had to revise the acknowledgements because Yasmin Zohar, who was a colleague and a friend, 
was murdered on October 7th, along with her husband and two daughters. Now, in the weeks that followed October 7th, um, as my family and friends in Israel were under constant rocket attacks, I was here, I was safe at Michigan State University. And many colleagues and friends and students reached out to me and offered support. And I am so grateful and thankful for that kindness. And as I spoke with my colleagues and students, um, I realized that um, many of them didn't know that Israelis were under constant rocket attack before, during, and after October 7th. Now, over the years, uh, thousands of rockets have been fired at Israelis. And as we note in the introduction, and I just looked, uh, we wrote the introduction somewhere around 2021. Quote, over the seven decades of the Israeli state, the conflict had flared up in different places at different times. For example, during the 1980s, the focus of the conflict was along the northern borders. It is again. And during the 1990s and the 2000s, the heart of Tel Aviv and Jerusalem were the focal point of the conflict. Since the Israeli unilateral withdrawal from Gaza in 2005, the main focus of the conflict in Gaza in the area known as the quote-unquote Gaza envelope was the main focus, sorry, of the conflict. Now, it might be useful uh, to remind everyone at this point that the cities and agricultural communities of the Gaza envelope, which were attacked on October 7th, are on Israeli territory. According to international law, these are not disputed or, or occupied territories. I'm going back to the introduction, quote, Israeli culture, uh, an emergency routine, is the product of a group of researchers from Sapir College, which is located near Stirot, a small city in the Gaza envelope. And the collection of articles grew out of our shared intellectual research interests as well of our shared, as well as out of our shared local experience. The unique conditions at Sapir College shaped the collection of articles that brings to the forefront the quote unquote state of emergency which is the reality of a large part of Israeli and Palestinian populations. Written by scholars who experience the state of emergency on a daily basis, the collection provides a theoretical framework for cultural attributes that are created in a climate of persistent anguish." End quote. Now, um, the book is a collection of academic articles, yet we added an epilogue with personal perspectives about our experiences as scholars under constant rocket attack. And we commence this two-part discussion of the book with a personal perspectives as we share some of the experiences of what it's like to be under constant attack and fear for one's safety. And we are here today to share some of our experiences, acknowledging the pain and devastation of all impacted by the conflict, as we hope that by sharing our perspective, we will have a better future together. Fate had it that Avner, Vered, and I uh, met about six years ago at Sapir Academic College, where we taught and conducted research. Sapir is, is a symbol of the norm normalization uh, of emergency. Its original college opening its, opening its gates of higher education and employment to a peripheral area. It, it thrives on students, student activism, volunteer activity, and bridging gaps between periphery and center, and, and cultivating culture uh, through collabor collabor collaboration such as um, quality film festival, festival with the college's esteemed communication department. 
students and uh, uh, sorry, there is even a train uh, for the for the convenience of lectures, students and residents. One hour ride from the center of Tel Aviv to the Hip College. Sounds great, right? Except this is the place where the events of October 7th occurred. At that time, six years ago, in the emergency routine in which we lived, a lit literature lesson was abrupt abruptly interrupted by the violence uh, by the violent siren and, and the call to seek refuge in protected spaces. Arabs and Jewish lecturers and students huddled together in the in a shelter sheltered room, waiting for the, the signal to return to normalcy, quote, uh, which wasn't truly totally normal at all. Back in the classroom, we tried to bridge the incomprehensible gap between literary analysis of Odysseus, for example, and the emotional storm generated by the situation and the um, um, extensional insecurity uh, it instilled. Living under a constant emergency routine, but functioning within it as if it was normal from lack of choice. We didn't imagine in our worst dreams that in this place, not long after, a brutal slaughter uh, of so many innocent victims and other war crimes such as rape, uh, discretion of the dead, and more would occur. Since the establishment of the State of Israel, especially since 1967, Israel has been in a legal status of state of emergency. The state of emergency is rooted in the disagreement over borders and persi persistent uh, threats. Our lives, our lives and the life of the state exist on an axis, a lifeline with peaks of violence and conflict and moments of calmness on the curve. In a situation of borders under dispute, conflict always looms, leading to oppression, power dynamics, and inevitable violence. October 7th marked a significant escalation point of the conflict, a peak moment of violence and agony. I hope this period will be a turning point and not another uh, point in the curve. The profound impact on the, on the collective and individual psyche inherent to the emergency routine pushes the nation into emotional crisis with a variety of emotional responses. Among them, you can find anger, often translated into violence and revenge. We see this in, uh, in the rays of extreme right-wing forces in Israeli politics and public discourse. As highlighted in Yael Schenker's article in the book on the dystopic novel depicting war and chaos in the Middle East. Fear. Is, common, is a common response to constant stress. Fear is a common response to constant stress, which can lead to either withdrawal and unproductive isolation, or morph into anger, also leading to vengeance, vengeance and violence. Different literary responses to the chaotic reality are identified by the scholars Nurit Gertz and Omri Herzog which will, which will uh, participate in tomorrow's discussion, who recognize two distinguished narratological strategies in Israeli prose of recent years. Some literary works eternalize the chaos, rejecting basic literary concepts such as linear plot, progression, clear narrative, and refuse to reference uh, to any historical or moral truth. 
this trend in literature es essentially forfeits the ability to organize a reality in order to understand and control it. Osnat Lemko's article brings to the forefront uh, the novel Tzabim, which is in a way, which in a way predicts the attacks of October 7th. The novel deals with the prolonged reality of, of the emergency routine and challenges realistic literature through unstable language and representation of reality. Israeli society as well as Palestinian society experience immense sorrow for all the grief and the suffering we're witnessing and hear about from the surroundings. Enormous number of kidnapped individuals trapped in the limbo of hell and other atro atrocities. Um, me, myself, I moved to Greece um, just in the be beginning of the war, so I'm a, I'm a refugee myself now, me and my small family. Avner here, maybe he'll say something about it, he's also a refugee in his own country. The agony about this pre prevents us from recovering, standing up, and demanding a change of reality. However, anger, fear, and agony are also processed through cultural production, turning into satire and transforming into critical humor, as shown in the works of senior Israeli comic artists Ruto Modan and Gilad Salikter, as demonstrated in the chapter written by, by Ilaria Stiller Timor. Their advice in their insightful article uses comparative literature to show how one of the most important novels in modern Hebrew literature dealing with trauma resulted by Israeli emergency routine and turns the trauma into empathy through uh, speci special metaphors and collective dim dimensions of memory. Chaim Beaton and Moti Gigi's article explores the intersection of gender and sociological access and political access in a worn torn area, the city of Sderot, which has been attacked by missiles for decades and is constantly in danger. The researchers ex examine the types of masculinity, masculinity forming the cinematic medium in response uh, to the instability uh, and unsafe reality. The roots of the Israeli internal conflict can be understood more deeply and broad, broadly through Avner Dinur's important article, which seeks the uniqueness of Israeli stressful identity, holding within, within it religious and national components that often contradicts each other. This variety of emotion brought about by emergency routine finds expressions in, in modes of thought and behavior reflected in the heart of the nation's culture. Literature and art created under these unique conditions provide diverse perspective on trends in Israeli society. Some are alarming and encourage us to take an action. Some inspire hope and many other effects. The book encompasses all these. Um, this is a first of its kind research project, bringing together authors from various disciplines whose biographical and research axes intersect and blend into each other, into each other. 10 writers, authors, participate in this book. Uh, and the common uh, denominator is their physical presence in the front line. Sociologists, cinema researchers, prose and poetry scholars, communication and Jewish studies scholars, comparative literature and visual arts converge under one banner because random biographical points in the biographies where they work, live, teach, and research, clash with the research topic um, and challenge it. In this way, 
Researchers approach the research subject, raising wealth of ethical, political, artistic, and other questions, and distancing themselves from it alternately to develop a critical perspective. I'm pleased that we're holding this event now in the eye of the storm, when the topic of the book is relevant, sadly, more than ever. The fearful choice was to wait until the situation calms down um, and time pulled off the emotions. But I'm here to speak up and react. Art responds to the subterranean currents in culture, and it is important to give a voice to diverse pers perspectives. We published this book and we're here today because we don't give up on the possibility of re reacting and being part of the discourse and trying to influence it as well as trying to influ influence reality. Thank you. for uh, the description of the book and, and for the joint work, two of you. Um, I want to, um, in my work, in what I'm going to say now, to um, combine some, some of my personal experience with um, analysis, with historical and political analysis, and see if it can be combined in any way. Uh, as Verad uh, said earlier, um, I'm a resident of Sderot, um, I guess um, most of you know that Sderot is um, the closest town to Gaza Strip. It's uh, two, two kilometers from the border. Um, and the, the city that uh, was suffered and influenced more than any other place in Israel um, along, these two, along these two decades. I'm living there for um, about 25 years, a few years before the rocket started. And I'm living in an urban kibbutz, a community called an urban kibbutz. Um, our community um, went for a bike ride. We went to all the community together to ride our bikes on the 5th of October. Um, and the, 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 the track, the route that we chose for that bike ride was more or less along the fence, about 50 meters from the fence. And the place we chose to, um, to spend the night in is about two kilometers from the Nova party uh, where all the, well, a lot of the massacres and a lot of uh, rapes and uh, really terrible things happened. It was about two kilometers from there this is where we chose to, to sleep. And along the, the way when we were riding the bikes, uh, we met a photographer. And, um, and I know this photographer because he's a... Uh, uh, his wife is a friend of mine, and this friend was just mentioned here by, by Vered, uh, Yasmin Zohar. And, um, this, and this photographer, Yaniv, um, asked us to greet the people of Israel for the holiday, and we did, which was great, uh, which was really a good feeling. And then, uh, and I guess that this was the, the last thing that uh, Yaniv uh, um, filmed because two days later he was murdered with his wife, our friend Yasmin, and the two daughters, and luckily the son, their son was saved on that, on that occasion. On that, on that bike ride we had um, uh, my son, who is 13 years old, he broke his leg. And that was quite lucky, I think, that he broke his leg because uh, we didn't uh, go to the place where to, these, to, to the other places who were also dangerous. Uh, also, our, our friends, none of them was, was hurt, but um, I'm, I'm now kind of happy that we weren't there at that time. Uh, and on the other hand, it was very unlucky because if in the next two, uh, two months, uh, he was unable to do what he is very used to do, which is running into shelter. Um, from the day that he was born until now, 13 years old, 13 years old, uh, he's very used to run to shelter every time there's a, an alarm. Uh, and when you have a broken leg, you cannot do that anymore, uh, which is, makes it uh, mo um, makes the stress more uh, harder for him. Uh, two days later, 
We woke up for the, um, at 6.30 in the morning for a lot of alarms, and um, quickly afterwards we got the message that, that there were units of Hamas in our town in Sderot. Um, there's not so many casualties in Sderot like in the Kibbutzim, but there, are, there were units, there were people killed. Um, 100 meters from our house, more or less, in our neighborhood, luckily, no one came in. After 30 hours in the safe room that we could not go out of the safe room, after 30 hours, um, we left. We, we, had, um, we, we got to know that the um, army in the streets, uh, Israeli army, and we left the city um, as fast as we could. And um, since then, I'm um, unable to go back to my home. I'm very, very hopeful that I will be able in the next two weeks, um, but until now, six, almost six months after, I, I'm, I'm a refugee in my own country, as uh, Irit said earlier. Um, since I teach uh, Jewish studies and philosophy in different places, um, I was telling some of the students uh, in one of the classes that I'm a refugee in my own um, country and uh, that it's not only me, there's another two million people who are unable to go back to their home at the minute, and some of them, many of them, will not be able to go back to their home at all in the future because they don't have a home at all. And one of the students um, raised his hand and said, um, you're absolutely wrong, there's not two million refugees, there's only 300,000 300, Israelis who um, cannot go back to their, to their home, and I was saying, no, there are two million. They, they were arguing, arguing with me, these students, not only him, but the other students. No, there's two million, two million or 300,000. And it took them about 15 minutes to realize that um, the, the hard situation that we're facing is not only from the one side, but it, for both sides. So I, was speak, I was speaking about the people from Gaza and the people from Israel. Uh, refugees who cannot go back to their home, uh, and they were so much focused only on, on the Israelis and could not see the full picture of what uh, what was happening um, um, to us. And I, I would like just to ask or to to think here in this evening, going back a little bit to, to our our bike ride to think how could we be how could we be so stupid how how could we go along the fence 50 meters from the fence and sleep in that place or um, wanting to sleep in that how, how could we be so stupid and i guess the best answer for that is the title of the book that we that we chose for the book an emergency routine living in a place where Emergency is the routine, and you, you want bike rides, you want something. And the other um, answer to this question, how could we be so stupid, would be the fence. What is enabling this emergency routine is uh, the fence that was built in 2019. Um, was the, the last part of the fence was, was established. There was a, um, um, a big part of the fence is under, underneath the ground. Um, the, 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 the army is saying that if you, if you take all the concrete that is in, inside the ground there, you can have a road from Israel to Bulgaria. Um, uh, it's something huge, something very big, and, this, and uh, with many sensors and cameras and, uh, to make sure that nobody can cross. And this small and not so very strong organization called Hamas just destroyed it in 10 minutes, this whole, this whole thing. So there's something, if you, they talk a lot, a lot in Israel about the conception now, and about the broken conception. Uh, the conception is the fence. The conception is the idea that you can build huge fences and be in, a, in your routine, in your daily life as you are. Um, Part of the conception, of this conception, is that Hamas can be contained. That Hamas can be, and why should it be contained? Because Hamas has an interest 
to govern uh, Gaza. And when you, um, um, when Hamas goes to this kind of, of act, like the 7th of October, it, um, it is really like a suicide. It's ruining its own rule of, of Gaza. But if you listen to Hamas, um, and if you listen to the, to the people of Hamas, you understand that ruling Gaza was never part of their, of their idea. You see that uh, they, they say again and again, we are here to, to, to free Palestine from the sea until the river. We are here to, to do that. We, are not, we don't want to rule Gaza. We don't want to be the, the sub-rulers of this small area where the real rulers are the, are the Israelis from the outside, where the real rulers are, is the occupation. This is the real ruler of, of, of Gaza. And we are only the, the small rulers in, 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 inside. So Hamas is very consistent, actually, in its uh, anti wall, anti-fence, anti-separation um, policy. Hamas doesn't want the fence at all. I cannot say that about Israel. If I look at the history of, uh, of Israel's reaction to the, to the wall, to the idea of separation between Palestinians and Israel, Israelis, it's quite clear that Israel is playing, Israel as a, as a nation, as a state, is playing with the idea of separation and togetherness. In 1948, if Israel would, would not have built the, the fence, would not have separated by its force, by, uh, uh, by, by, by the war, by the 1948 war, if it would not have built this fence, Israel would not have would would not have been a democracy because between the the, the the sea and the river there was a majority of Arabs and the majority of Palestinians. So you build a wall, you chase seven hundred thousand people from the Jewish state to the other side, and you construct a, a, a democratic Jewish uh, state. If such a thing. Is ever is even possible to be a democratic Jewish state, but that's not that's another discussion we're not going to do today, I guess, right? Uh, we, we don't want. To. And then in 1967, the same Israel is not constructing the fence; it is ruining the fence. In 1967, conquering the West Bank, conquering Gaza, and ruling it from 1967 until today. So. Why was it so important in 1948 to build a fence and to completely demolish it in 1967? Uh, and when I move forward in history, and I'm coming to the 2000s, to 2000s then you see three huge um, uh, projects of separation again. The, the wall between the West Bank and Israel, the separation wall, that's one project, the disengagement from Gaza in 2005, when Israel just left um, one, one-sided, one un, what, what's the word Unilateral. 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 Um, just unilateral uh, disengagement going, going out. So this is the fence, we're building the fence. And then the finishing of the, of the separation wall in 2019, as I said earlier, is another project. So so big projects of walls, of fences, of separation. Um, and now, with a little help from Hamas, again breaking the wall and wanting to rule what is going on beyond the wall. Because if we don't, there's no safety for, for, for Israelis. So breaking the wall and establishing the wall and breaking the wall, why, why is that? Why is that? What, what, what's, what's the... What's the reason for that? Um, my chapter in the book is dealing with that. I think that um, the, the combination of uh, a nation, of a nation, nationality and religion is part of the reason, is the part of the reason why the Zionist movement is unable to think in uh, normal national terms and establish a 
um, um, a political entity that belongs to all the citizens of that entity. Um, I would not elaborate too much on that today, but tomorrow uh, a, little, a little more if, uh, if any of you is planning to come tomorrow. Um, but I do want to say something, uh, just a few more words before I, before I finish, uh, about this ambivalence of Israel towards the defense. Not only why it happened, but also what's the, um, what's the consequences of that. And I, I will say this, um, when you build a fence and destruct, destroy it again and again, you, um, you cause, um, or you, um, you make a kind of a reality that I can call, and I, I'm, I want to call here, uh, together anyway and necessarily separate it. So you, you, you construct a reality in which it is absolutely impossible to separate Palestinians and Israelis. They're not separated. And it, at the same time, it is absolutely impossible to make them uh, uh, one, share, one uh, um, nation. It's impossible to separate, and it's impossible to make one really combined uh, uh, nation. Uh, if you ask me, I, I think personally that uh, full separation is not, not something good. I, would not, I, don't, I don't aspire a full separation. And I also don't aspire for you. And I'm very happy with my Jewish identity. I'm very focused on my, I, I, I work on about that. I, I write about my Jewish identity. I don't want to lose that. I don't want full separation. I don't want full uh, uh, union of, the both, uh, of both cultures. But what I, what I want to say here, for uh, just to, to sum up here, is that Zion, the Zionist movement and the State of Israel causing this uh, problematic in one hand and very uh, uh, full of, uh, it's a game of powers actually, it's a game of, of, of controlling of this together and separated, together and separated. Uh, but on the other hand, I would, I would, it, it's very clear to me that this is reality. I, I don't, we can discuss here for hours why did Zion, the Zionist movement cause or, or, or initiated this kind of reality, but this is reality. And if you look at it uh, simply, it's, it's quite clear that the solution, any kind of solution, one state, two state, a confederation, a federation, you can think of, you can, people talk today about different Solutions, and I'm very involved and in different solutions to the to the conflict. Uh, but all of these uh, of these solutions are based on the idea of necessarily separated and together anyway. Necess necessarily separated and together anyway. And what we Palestinians and Israelis need to do, and I think I'm I personally I I try to do my best to. To do something about that is to come up with political uh, um, solutions that will be uh, can can contain this um, ambivalence, this need that this clarity that full separation would not be would never happen, and this clarity that full union. Full union is maybe maybe possible, but only in two or three hundred more years, and we don't really uh, want to. We don't really care about that uh, uh, too much. How how to do that? What what to do about uh, to uh, advance this kind of uh, new approach? Um, we need some political movements. We need some uh, um, cultural work, and I think that. Part of what we what we did here in in the book is to to show how how um, how this complexity is um, um, shown in, in in culture in culture in art in poetry and so on. Thank you.
before we open uh, the discussion to questions, I just want to uh, follow up with two quick comments. One, um, I'd like to draw the distinction, uh, so I'm not a political science expert, um, but I think there's a distinction between displaced people and refugees, um, refugees being people who had to escape their country and displaced people are people who are displaced within their country. So that's just a quick uh, terminology so, so follow. You, you would say that Irit is refugee, a refugee and displaced? displaced. Um, I, I, I'm not a political science expert, but this is my understanding of the distinction. And we have policy experts here who can uh, correct me. Uh, but this is just a quick follow-up. The, the second quick follow-up that I want to offer is from my discipline. I am a comparative and world literature um, scholar. Earlier, and I talked about this a, a while ago, um, uh, when I discuss the various walls in Jerusalem and Israel, so there's a, a wall, the Western Wall, the Wailing Wall, the wall, which is um, the holiest place to um, religious Jews in the world. And then there are the walls surrounding the old city of Jerusalem. And then, of course, there is the separation wall. Um, and when I talk with my students about these walls, I start with Robert Frost, the mending wall. I won't, I won't uh, recite the entire poem. The poem starts, something there is that doesn't love a wall. Th these are the first words of the poem. Something there is that doesn't love a wall. And it is, a, I am, pardon my uh, freedom with Frost here, but we follow these two neighbors uh, and every um, spring they come together from both sides of the wall and build the wall. And we engage in their thoughts. And one of them says, good fences make good neighbors. Right. He says that his father told him, good fences make good neighbors. I won't, I, I won't recite the entire poem, but I commence the discussion of walls and separation with a comparative and world perspective, because this question about, these questions about identities and separation and walls arguably are universal questions we have been asking ourselves for millennia. Uh, and I ask my students, what are some of the walls that, are, that you're familiar with? And of course, my students mention the Berlin Wall, the Great Wall of China. And there are, of course, other walls that are relevant in contemporary discourses. So I just want to offer a broader perspective about these discussions that are not necessarily only pertinent to Israelis and Palestinians, but are really broader questions that um, I think we ask ourselves. So that's okay. um, my uh, quick follow-up. Can, um, can, can I comment on that, or do you want to question us first? Um, yes, do, do you want to comment? Thank you very much for this for the comment. I, I really appreciate it, the, this connection. But I, I do want to add something about that, and uh, maybe that I, maybe I should have said it earlier. That I think there's this idea of necessarily separated and together anyway uh, is really um, part of it is really understanding that any any future for Israel. Including the idea of two of two states, including the idea of two states, is not uh, um, the wall is not part of it. And I think people who uh, are very uh, and I think Frost is 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 very uh, ambivalent about this about this uh, uh, quote. He's not really saying it's not what he wants to say, and it, but not the, also not the opposite that good fences or good walls make good make good neighbors. 
um, I think it's very, very clear to see that uh, um, in any possible future, including two states, there will be no, no war. And I, I also think that uh, what happened on the, on the 7th of October was that Hamas was showing Israel that not only Israel can play with the wall, um, construct it and destruct it uh, again and again, but also they can do that. That, that's a, that, that is our, that is my personal tragedy. The people of Hamas said, we, we can play with the wall as much as we want. We can, de we can destruct, destruct it uh, um, in, in 10 minutes. Your, your, your wall is nothing. Um, but at the same time, I would say that uh, when Hamas is destroying that wall, it is also showing that, his, that, that this organization's uh, policy is not constructed on the idea of togetherness. It's very clear that they, dest they destroy the wall in order for, uh, uh, in order for uh, to make clear for me that I cannot live in my in my house. That it's impossible to be to be in my house, and 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 they don't want me to be displaced. They want to be re to be a refugee. They want me to be out of the, of the country. So in this in this term, I would say that Hamas changed the way we see the whole conflict. It is not anymore a conflict between the, colon the colonizers who invaded the, co the, 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 um, the, the, the space and, and, uh, and conquered it, and the innocent people who, are, uh, who were colonized. It's not, we're, we're not there anymore. Something changed, something very, very radical changed. When, um, People of, when the people of Israel um, um, came to this conclusion that they are, that this project, Zionism, the state of Israel, is not a defense. It's not, it's not a good defense for them. It's not, it's not uh, uh, if, if you want to, uh, uh, to defend the Jewish people, that the Zionist project became a threat, and a serious threat. Um, maybe I'll, I'll um, so we're going to open it to questions and um, I just want to point uh, uh, everyone to a couple of symposium that uh, that we had here um, that explore that so we had several um, panels that talked about solutions and also a panel that talked about the fact that Climate, for example, doesn't acknowledge borders. And if we know uh, that uh, we share the water, and we share um, other resources, we should hopefully work together uh, politically um, to make sure that people can live and share resources. So just uh, if people are interested, there are interest, I think there are useful resources um, here at MSU um, that you can find on the Serling Institute website. Um, so thank you. Um, I want to open it up for questions. So I, um, I see already that we have questions. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. <coughs> I, you know, much colder here than it is in Israel today. So we appreciate you being here for for uh, for us and to present to us. Um, I grew up in the envelope around the Gaza envelope. Uh, I grew up in Beit Kama until I was 16, so right in your area. Um, and one of the things that I do remember is that, and that I've seen more and more in Israel lately uh, in the last. 20 years, is that more and more places surround themselves by a fence. Uh, not only is the big projects that are building the fence around, build the fence or the wall around the Gaza Strip and around the West Bank and around the border with Lebanon and uh, the fence with Egypt that never existed and then was built in the last few years, but also kibbutzim have always been surrounded by a fence. 
and unlike your city kibbutz that I'm sure was not surrounded by a fence, but my kibbutz was always surrounded by a fence, and I knew all the ways to get through the, that fence without needing to go out through the gate. Um, and so the sense that Israel community is Israel community and Arab or Palestinian community is Palestinian community and we're talking about the separation between those two communities and that's the only separation we're talking about, that's actually not true. <clears throat> because Israel, especially in the quote unquote post melting pot uh, um, era, in the multicultural society era, has seeked to create more and more separations between distinct communities. Uh, Orthodox communities are very much separated in most cases than secular communities. In the area around the road, there was just, uh, or around the Gaza Strip, there was just an interview uh, in Haaretz about two weeks ago with a person that used to be uh, the, I don't know what the title would be in English, but kind of the CEO of the Kibbutzim uh, organization, Noah Kibbutzit, and uh, he said that after this war, the Kibbutzim are not going to invite people from Sderot to celebrate on their lawns because for them that's home and people that are not from home are not allowed to go there. <coughs> so as we're trying to understand the trauma and the, the uh, dealing with this constant normalization of trauma, what is the difference between different communities in dealing with these traumas. If you are a Sderot, uh, uh, somebody that lives in Sderot from a former, uh, f formerly from a North, America, a North African uh, community, you're more religious, you're not as necessarily participating in higher education, maybe economically you're not as successful. Is your experience of trauma the same or different from the experience of a kibbutznik that lives in a in an environment that's very, very different, usually from maybe more from Ashkenazi background, maybe more educated, maybe you teach in Sapir or you went to Sapir or you went to another university in the area. Is there a shared experience or is it because of cultural and political differences that the experience of trauma is different? Thank you. Emergency routine affects everyone and in different ways, in many different ways. But uh, no one can escape from this trauma. It's a national trauma, it's an individual trauma. If you are uh, say, uh, a resident of the Gaza envelope, you're very affected, your, your, your daily routine is interrupted. But even if you live in Tel Aviv or in the center of Israel and you're not in the front line, you experience it in many different ways. You have relatives there, your uh, son or daughter go to the army and serve there, um, your father who was a soldier in Yom Kippur war, and the trauma is all around you. And the, the, the Israeli culture is built on normalizing the stress, making this impossible stress normal and just live, just cope with it, just uh, survive and live your life as if you're a normal, I don't know, European state uh, with uh, um, borders that are, uh, that are very distinct. Um, of course, there are uh, differences. If you live in a kibbutz, if you're Ashkenazi, if you're Mizrahi, um, but you're all, but all of the, the citizens, uh, all, all Israeli society is a subject of this emergency routine. Um, maybe they can answer better. Thank you for the question. Uh, I, when you were asking, I, was, I realized that uh, probably the two of us went to the same high school. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so we come from a close area. Uh, maybe I, I, I completely agree with with uh, with Irit saying that it's a shared experience for everybody in, in, in the area. And what I said in the beginning of my words that I said about uh, people about students unable 
to experience, to um, really listen to the other side, see what's going on on the other side. I want to make it even broader than what you what you say. It's the it's a shared experience, um, which in many ways it's also shared by us and by the Gazans. People in Ga- people in Gaza and people in the Gaza envelope are suffering the same same experience of uh, pe- people who were uh, completely. Um, <laughs> People who were, yes, yes, how much? Um, I'll get back to you. Huh? Okay, uh, pe- people who were neglected um, by their by their um, governing authority. People of Gaza were neglected by the authority of Gaza, and attacked brutally by another regime. And the people in the Gaza envelope were neglected by the Israeli army and attacked brutally by another regime. And I think this, this is something that is in common. There's many differences, and I'm not saying it's the same thing. But I'm, that's not the point. The point is that uh, these two um, communities, or more than two, as you, as you said, it's more than two, um, uh, suffered something something similar in this way. Something. I'll just add one uh, word about the uh, shared experience of trauma. Um, we were talking earlier about the, the different points of this conflict in the 1980s in the north, in the 90s and the 2000s uh, in Tel Aviv, in Jerusalem, and then along the border with Gaza. These are also different kinds of uh, escalations, um, and yet they are also similar. I'm not sure that saying that similar trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder and continuous stress are the same. I think drawing similarities is one thing, but I'm not sure about equating different communities, and I'm not sure about equating the kinds of trauma and uh, suffering on the two sides of the fence. I understand the uh, point about the um, neglect and um, betrayal by the betrayal. Old, by their governing policies, but again, I'm not sure that there would be broad consensus about that. Thank you for such an interesting and thought-provoking panel and look forward to the second part uh, tomorrow morning. Um, I don't know if you could speak a little more. You gave some kind of uh, um, political analysis and, and context, which I know in your, in your book you also refer to in terms of uh, the people, th- that's the pr- you know one of the problems with resilience and, and normalizing stress is that people then um, aren't moving to to change um, things as rapidly. And so you're kind of referring to that, but I don't know if you could speak a little in terms of what you just mentioned, uh, Vered, in terms of, I think you in the book are saying that about 10% of Israelis suffer from PTSD uh, and you know how that's affecting um, some of the literature that you examine and other um, cultural things that you examine. How, how does that manifest? If you can give us a, a little, um, teaser for tomorrow in terms of uh, the actual, you know, how this is analyzed in the book. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so the plan is uh, to talk more about the chapters tomorrow, but um, just again by way of uh, teasing uh, about this. So first of all, there are different. Um, terminology here, right? Post-traumatic stress disorder, as the title suggests, is about trauma that is in the past. And so this disorder is about flashbacks and about disruption to daily life that is uh, anchored in an event that was in the past and was somehow, the. this is a simplification, but our psyche tries to repress it, but it comes back with a vengeance. And we see in Israeli culture 
numerous representations of post-traumatic stress disorder, um, including in the chapter that I uh, address where we see Avram uh, who came back from the 1973 um, Egyptian captivity, suffered horrendous torture and becomes this recluse, unable to be a part of society. Uh, but we see many representations of post-traumatic stress disorder, um, of, of arguably one of the most famous cinematic depictions of this is in uh, Wells with Bashir, which is a film, Ali Fullman's um, famous film, where which explores this issue of post-traumatic stress disorder. Another thing that we see is um, continuous traumatic stress. And as the name suggests, this is different because the trauma is not something in the past, but it continues. So constant war, constant conflict produces a different kind of reaction because People don't have time to suppress and are constantly required to react. Um, and we see this as well in uh, art and literature and poetry. Um, and one of the things that I'm uh, interested in, and it's something that we just talked about amongst us, it's not a teaser for tomorrow, it's a teaser for future uh, work. The you mean our next book? <laughs> well, it's actually it's it's an article that I'm uh, writing for the next uh, AIS conference uh, in July, trying to work through what is going on currently in Israeli society, and I'm interested in these tensions between empathy and resilience. So empathy is precisely that feeling with someone, but if you are constantly under attack, you don't have that um, leisure. And um, moreover, with the recent events, currently still over a hundred people are being held hostage, including young women who are currently still being held and if you allow yourself to feel empathy and m my entire academic work is dedicated to encouraging people to feel empathy and I still want to encourage people to feel empathy but what happens when that empathy hinders your ability to carry on. And I know that resilience has, you know, is sort of a, a bad word. After COVID, people are not supposed to talk about resilience, right? We're supposed to not try to be resilient and allow ourselves to acknowledge our pain. But what if you can't? What if you are constantly under attack? What if your loved ones are being held as hostages? And this really produces um, a, a very um, troubled cultural and um, so literary and prose and cinema that is affected by these issues. And yes, uh, um, I don't have the statistics at the tip of my hand, but approximately 10% of Israeli society is diagnosed with various um, post-traumatic stress disorders. And up until recently, this was almost not addressed. There are extraordinary um, changes happening, and people are acknowledged as um, veterans. Um, it's still a process. Um, and just before October 7th, Israel was reckoning with the Yom Kippur War. And people were talking about their post-traumatic stress. 50 years. 50 years. Um, and just as these 
stories were surfacing and literature and culture and poetry was addressing these a new horrible atrocious layer of new uh, trauma was added and so Israeli culture is really this layer upon layer of trauma post-traumatic stress disorder and continuous trauma um, we hope uh, I, I, we hope to end this cycle. Uh, I, uh, I always say I am this uh, bizarre oxymoronic creature. I'm an optimistic Israeli um, still. Um, I see we have more questions. So first of all, Todaraba and Kola Kavon. I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting to this book. Um, I'm very interested and in, yeah, unfortunately, I won't be able to make it tomorrow for the rest of um, the speaking, um, but I'm looking forward to reading this. And my question for you is I couldn't tell if the book um, touches on this, the impact of the emergency routine in Israeli culture in terms of how Israelis socialize. Uh, and to be specific, you know, I've been to Israel a number of times, and God willing, Bezrat Hashem, I'll be back as soon as possible. But um, I've always been interested in the kind of the differences in how, and certainly in the American perspective, at least, of how Israelis socialize in the sense of they tend to be very straightforward, maybe sometimes impatient. Um, you know, waiting in lines can be is a very new experience for Americans in, in Israel. Um, but also very welcoming. You know, if you need a place for Shabbat dinner, if you need help with finding something, you know, Israelis tend to be very supportive in that way. And so I think that's kind of an interesting contrast. And I wonder if, if it's touched on in the book as it re may relate to emergency routine and that pressure that Israelis perhaps always feel, or if it's not in the book, if you can comment on that. And, until my colleagues gather their thoughts, uh, I'll tell you an anecdote. Right. Um, one day I was coming back from the airport in Israel and uh, I had a laptop and a bag and a suitcase and I went into a light and a lot of people were entering and I said, please let me alight. And one of them with a wink and a smile said, why stick around, go for the next station. And so this kind of uh, what you're describing, right, on the one hand, rude, and on the other hand, with a wink and a smile, trying to um, create a sense of camaraderie. And this is something that you had mentioned earlier. You know, in, in Israel, we, we talk to our professors, our, we use first name basis, which I know to my local students is uh, um, unthinkable. And one of the reasons is because if you know that there's a very high likelihood that in a few minutes you're going to run for shelter with this person, it sometimes it undermines a certain kind of distance which um, other societies um, maintain. Um, I hope it's clear that I'm not uh, offering a judgment on any of those societies, but uh, commenting um, about what you said. We did not touch this question directly in the book, um, but now when I think of it and uh, try to answer the question, uh, I think it, it has a lot to do with the Sabra myth you know, sweet on the inside, but very um, has a thorny on the outside. Um, the phrase resilience, the, the term resilience um, that was mentioned here, has a lot to do with uh, this kind of mentality you mentioned, because it's a uh, it's not it's not privilege. It's a uh, it's a necessity to have these thorns and to be resilient. Um, any other way you can't uh, you 
you can't survive. You can't. Uh, you can't live with the contradictions that this reality uh, uh, present to you. So, I think if you read the book, uh, you can find in some of the literary and artistic works that uh, that we discuss uh, this uh, ambivalence. This, this exact, exact ambivalence you mentioned. Um, you can see it in, in the comic uh, art, in the comic novels, which has a lot of humor and satire and um, look at this uh, whole situation and emergency routine with a lot of criticism. But with uh, also humor, humor that you know sometimes uh, you know it's it's like sarcasm. It it, uh, it hurts this kind of humor, but it helps you pro process uh, what you're going through and reflects it in in, a, in, in an, an artistic way that, that gives you the opportunity to to accept this harsh reality. I, I want to kind of combine the two questions. Um, thinking of, of P, uh, PTS, PTSD or, or CT, uh, continuous uh, trauma, um, while, while working on, about, on the book, we had a few times uh, thought that um, we don't have a psychological um, uh, essay, not even one in the book. Uh, also, we deal with trauma, we deal with uh, the feeling of emergency, but we chose not to, not to do it in a psychological aspect, but from our Cultural, cultural and identity, cultural and identity responses, cultural and identity responses to uh, to the uh, emergency routine, um, and I think um, we, we didn't do do much about uh, like the what you say the, the characteristics of the Saba of, uh, of the, the the average Israeli. We did, we, we chose to to work on. On cultural, uh, uh, but I, I, I also think that there's something related f with um, the feeling of shared faith, the feeling of that we are here together. We, we are stuck here together in this in this thing. Um, and for and also the, when I say we are stuck here, it's the un the inability to see that it's not only Jews are stuck he here together in this in this bubble in this bottle uh, uh, in this flames uh, but Palestinians are also with us in the same reality um, and it's it's uh, really amazing to see how Israelis um, are really have a very strong sense of identity in this way and we are here stuck together so we should be we should rely on each other and on the other hand, we are stuck together. Why? I don't want to be with you. Who cares about you? Uh, so on. Uh, and it's all, it's all connected to this shared, uh, this belief, strong belief in shared faith. Uh, and at the same time, uh, inability to see the other side. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, so I have some uh, questions that are kind of scholarly in nature, but before I establish the scholarly distance, I... Uh, since a lot of the um, conversation here has been about, well, you talked about personal experience and Veret spoke about empathy and connection, which I think is goes with empathy. So I'll just tell two short anecdotes. One is, so I'm from Israel originally, but I've been in the United States for a long, long time. Uh, so um, uh, one anecdote is about my initial year in the United States. This was 2001. I arrived to the United States three days before the attack on the Twin Towers uh, to start my uh, um, um, doctorate. But, so I arrived to the United States in 2001, and a few months after I was in the U.S., I wrote to friends in Israel and pointed out to them that I noticed that my facial muscles have relaxed while walking in the streets of Chicago. And this was after the attack on the Twin Towers. Okay, it's not New York. It's Chicago, but you know, everybody in the United States was kind of going nuts, at least initially after the Twin Towers attack. Uh, but to me, it felt like I realized I was physically relaxing in ways that, um, uh, well, I didn't realize that I was so tense in Israel is the point, right? 
I had to be here to feel the facial muscle relax. So that's one anecdote. The other anecdote is I was nowhere near Israel in October 7th. I was here. But um, a few days after or a few weeks after, I don't remember, uh, my, uh, my better half, my significant other, shook me in the middle of the night to wake me up. She said, you're crying in your sleep. What? So it affects, you know, and uh, uh, the effect on me is not to do with space. I wasn't there. I'm not from the Gaza envelope. It's just because I'm from Israel. I don't know. You know, that's... The... So those are the anecdotes. Um, the scholarly questions. Um, so uh, one has to do with uh, uh, trauma and the way you are using it, the concept. The other has to do with language because at least two of you are literary scholars, right? I mean, Avner presented himself as a bit of a different, you know, the philosophy and Jewish thought, but... And then maybe a historical question, because I am a historian after all. So uh, the question about trauma. So trauma, as you alluded to just now, Avner, originally is not only a psychological category, it's a medical category. It comes from medicine originally. Uh, and it meant something quite specific. It's become something quite different that's used widely, absolutely not unique to Israel at all or to Palestine. Everybody increasingly since the 1990s, is using that concept to allude to a wide variety of experiences. Here on campus, since the shooting last year, a lot of people are talking about trauma and being traumatized. As a historian, I would say, definitely overused. There's an inflation of the term, which is interesting in its own right, and often means very different things, right? Uh, um, so what I... One of the characteristics of trauma, at least as it's understood in psychiatric literature, is that it, it is the impossibility of narrating what you've been through and how it affects you. So if you can say, I was traumatized by this, by this, by this, that's not trauma. You don't need to go to a psychiatric office to talk about it. Because if you do go to a psychiatrist's office, what they're going to help you try and do is come up with a narrative that will explain your current actions in the light of an experience that you've had in the past, you can't make the connection. You need to go to a psychiatrist. So I wonder, in a way, um, if trauma is, at least in psychiatric li literature, the impossibility of narrating coherently what you've been through, what do you do with that as literary scholars? Uh, 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 that's uh, 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 one thing. The second question is about uh, uh, language. Uh, I think in literature, in the human sciences, in philosophy, I think, in the social sciences, it's become something of a con uh, an axiom, which I, by the way, question all the time. But it's become something of an axiom that language shapes reality. This is the language metaphor, right? The linguistic turn. The way we talk shapes how we live. We don't say certain words. We make race relations better, right? Whatever, right? So my question is, in some of you studies poetry, of Aaron Shabtai, as somebody who studies, um, I forget what novel you wrote about for uh, David Grossman and Borges, I saw. Uh, uh, um, so uh, my question is, um, you talked a lot about how the literary works, the language uh, reflects this uh, emergency routine, which by the way is a contradiction, right? The emergency. And also, if I'm not mistaken, comes from the work of uh, doctors. I think it's a term that was applied originally to the work of physicians in ERs, emergency routine. But anyway, um, so you, you, you talk about how, you, I'm assuming you talk about how this stuff is reflected in the literary works that you're examining, but can language also and can cultural production, film, whatever, poetry, uh, if it can shape reality, can it narrate reconciliation. Can, so instead of a language only representing a term that Vela used several times, representation, representation, can there be a, a cult, what is what would be the role of cultural production in shaping, in fostering a some kind of, uh, how did Avner put it? You have to be together even though you want to be separate, something like that, or uh, some kind of togetherness or reconciliation 
can cultural productions do that? I'm thinking about the example of South Africa after apartheid, where the role of truth commissions wasn't really to find the truth. It was to create a narrative that blacks and whites in South Africa after apartheid could cohere around. I don't know how successful it was, but that was the goal. And maybe we need something like that. Eventually, one day in the region, I leave the historical question because it's less interesting. Uh, so I'll stop there. I agree with you about uh, the extensive use of uh, the term trauma. It has been uh, uh, an inflation of this term. Um, I think you're the few different uh, explanations for this term. Um, and if you go with the uh, philosopher Dominique Lacabra, for instance, uh, he will tell you that uh, trauma never ends. And the way that you gain uh, control or, or try to put some sense in it is narrating it and telling it again Trauma is the event that happens which has no words and no um, um, uh, signs. It's, it's out of, of the reach of our language. And in order to, to move on from the trauma, you have to put it into words, to put it into um, a series of events that one followed the other and you put uh, and you organize it and by that you try to control it you try to understand it but you never can words cannot express this trauma uh, when we speak about trauma in our book we we treat we we use it as a cultural uh, disorder not just an individual disorder. And as, as a society, as a culture, we're, we're a traumatized uh, society. Um, literary and, and other artistic or cinematic works try to understand it and try to um, suggest uh, solutions, uh, critical perspective, um, many kinds of, of those representations do not reflect. They, uh, they represent with the artistic or literary um, twist. You can see, you can identify uh, some of the traumatic uh, lines or, or features in the way the language is used, the way the, the representation of reality collapses, um, and other literary strategies or artistic strategies. Um, we try to, to put light on those uh, strategies and on those uh, artistic suggestions uh, as a way of uh, reviving I don't know, this the trauma, um, and trying to be critical about it and see how much it affects our life as individuals and, and as nation. And maybe it helps us uh, to change reality. Thank you. We um, are getting well, we're actually past our time. Um, I will follow up with just a quick mention of the way language is used to articulate trauma in David Wasman. Um, it follows, uh, to the end of the land follows a woman who is trying to run away from the news of her, of her son's death um, in a, dreadful twist of ironic, uh, in, in a dreadful ironic twist of reality, 
Gossman's son died in the war just as he was writing this book. The moment I want to mention to answer your question is a moment when Aura, this mother, trying to escape the news of her son's death, uh, they, they're rummaging around the Galilee. She digs a hole into the ground and starts speaking to the hole articulating her anguish into the soil. I'm not going to read it because we, we are already out of time. Uh, I will warmly recommend the book to everyone, um, not only because of that moment, but that is a moment where language ends. There is no way to articulate this anguish in, except for crying and talking into the soil, this soil that has seen so much bloodshed. Um, we are over our time. Um, so even though I, I think there are still a lot of hopefully uh, good questions, we will adjourn for today. Um, I want to thank you all very much and warmly invite you to join us tomorrow here at 10.30. Uh, Nurit, Professor Nurit Gertz and Professor uh, Omri Hertog will be joining us via Zoom from Israel to discuss the book further. Thank you all very much.